back home now in Las Vegas and glad to be back. What you are looking at is the time I spent at the American Military Cemetery in the Philippine Islands. Driving through this entrance and going to the cemetery circle, we passed through thousands and thousands of crosses of all the United States soldiers who died during World War II. I used to ride my bicycle here when I was just a young boy of about 10 or 12 years old. We would walk around and get reminded early on the true meaning of these crosses and the soldiers who rest in peace beneath them. Nothing could be more sobering, teaching a young mind the true cost of freedom early on in my life for each and every one of these souls, the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice during World War II has been done and they rest peacefully. God bless America. Hello, it's been a while. I probably, uh, I think I posted one video uh, last month. Well, I'm back home. I was overseas in the Philippine Islands, um, tried to uh, give assistance to an oil additive there that was uh, in dispute with uh, another company. And uh, I had to basically testify uh, in their defense on what their product is all about. But that's all up in the air right now. Uh, so we'll see what eventually comes up. Because as soon as they talk to me, and uh, I guess the guys basically called it off, and uh, I think they want to call their own expert. <laughs> anyway, but that's uh, that's another story. But here we go. Today we'll talk about just engine setup. What do we do, or what are the questions to be asked when you want to do an engine buildup? Just like a patient, you gotta look at the weight of the person that you're trying to deal with, the weight of the car is important. You just don't build, you know, a small block, whatever, 350, 351.4 or 302, 327, whatever, and, and then uh, not really knowing where this car is gonna go. Is it gonna be in a heavy Chevelle or is it gonna be a lightweight Camaro or a Mustang? Or a Nova or a Maverick? These things really matter because you just don't build for the sake of building and you know, you know it all. You gotta know the particulars of what is the weight, gearing, transmission. For example, I'm not gonna build a 400 small block Chevy if it's gonna be in a Chevelle. I'd say right off the bat, let's say a 70 Chevelle, 71, 72, I'll just say right off the get-go, let's build a big one, okay? And that, that one really is gonna give it as much bang for the buck because to tell you the truth it's kind of hard to to build you know a galaxy or a fair lane you know the later fair lane not, not the lightweight fair lanes of the mid 60s and try to do that with a 302 i'd say you just go straight to a 351 or if the guy wants a little bit of a, a power just go with a stroker but here we go I know a lot of you, and I said this again, and I'll repeat again over and over until I drive home the plane. Why do you build a 377 or a 393? Just go straight to a 408, okay? And also at the same time, when you're already building for a 408, like I said, torque is king on the street. Just build a 4170 stroke or a 4100. You'll be better served, okay? And I tell you what. You gotta find the balance between engine displacement and the car weight. And of course the gearing comes in. Four speed, five speed, and oh my God, express your street car, a two speed power glide. Ouch, okay? If the guy insists on a power glide, I'd say build up a big block. 454, even a 396, really. But since you don't have the gear ratio, it really comes into play if you have a car 
with the same cubic inches and when you have a three speed automatic or four speed or a power glide, guess what? The one with three speed and four speed will be quicker than a comparable engine, especially with a weight uh, strapped on it, a Chevelle, or you know, some guys have a lowered station wagon. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to run a two speed power glide. Okay? Not only that. Splitting the gear ratio to different uh, uh, four speed or five speed, it's much, much better from the standpoint of trying to stay away from detonation. When you have a two speed power glide, okay, was a high one nine, right, or one eight first gear ratio, then suddenly it goes first, goes to final drive. It's a prescription to detonation, okay, and I would suggest stay away from that except maybe you got a high horsepower build you want to cut down on the gear ratio sure okay two speed power glide is hard to beat but you're not going to do that with with basically a uh, you know a heavy car think about this a 327 350 or 351 or 302 in a galaxy or a chevelle <laughs> it's heavy now you're looking at the the mid 60s chevelle that might not be too bad or the you know, mid 60s Fairlane or Maverick, late 60s Maverick or early 70s. Sure, you can get away with a 302 or a 347 three, Stroker. Better yet, on the street, hard to beat a 400 Stroke, you know, 4 Stroke or 4100 or 4170. I tell you what, every little bit of a stroke, it picks up the bottom end. Okay, you don't have to rev it as high. Just like when you have a, you know, a 383 Chevy as opposed to a 400, you know, and uh, you put the 4120 high board, it's going to be hard to beat as opposed to a 40 over, 60 over uh, 350 Chevy. And at the same time, I would run a roller cam. Must. In today's oil, the thin oils, you got to run a roller cam. A lot of people make excuses. Well, I had nothing going wrong with my flat tap and so on. So you were lucky. All right, the today's thin oil don't have much zinc, and the lifters, the hydraulic tappets, need to have some kind of rotation. With a super thin oil, very slippery, and I want to rotate and keep it alive. It'll stay at that one position and dig a hole on the face of the lifter. So, save yourself some money in the long run. Buy the more expensive roller cams. Or do the conversion retrofit from crane cop cap all those are alternatives i will never build a flat tappet engine for the street except for some guy who is really a purist oh i want to hear that 327 350 horse camshaft flat tappet i love it as well or the c90 6250c uh hypo camshaft or the c30 6250c with a 271 horse 306 uh, camshaft they sound real good but I tell you what when you play with that low center that changes your idle characteristics sometimes you can get close to the sound of those uh, late 60s muscle car type uh, camshaft for a Z28 or a 271 306 horse 289 or even a Boss Trail 2 you can mimic those uh, talk to your cam manufacturer they know more than anybody I'm not about to give you an advice and do this uh, you know, math and uh, we all, this, you're going to end up with this kind of divide and, and you know, and you're going to come up with this formula. Uh, there's nobody better than the cam manufacturers. I deal with CompCam, go to the tech line, or specifically when you have a personal um, relationship with a cam manufacturer like I do with uh, uh, Iskander and CamShaft. I talk to, to Rod out there or Noah, Noah Jamara. And I tell you, they, they've seen it all, they've tested it, they have feedback from hundreds of customers, more than I could ever have, or an engine builder. They know their stuff. Okay, and I'm not about to say, well, I have this formulation, so uh, leave that up to somebody who's got a lot of time. All right? I would refer to these guys, and they will tell you from their feedback. Because I, they, I went through these guys through the years too. They know what kind of camshaft I end up running. They know how much lift I'm pushing for any given combination. Except maybe for the all-out racing engines and stuff. That's all a little different. 
and also uh, independent cam grinders like American Cam Joey out there. I have a personal relationship. He's a good friend. Same thing. Okay? He's got so much feedback into the cam grinds. And he'll tell you, hey, use this or use that. I, I put my faith in these guys. All right. Let's talk about cylinder heads. Just like in camshaft, the manufacturers, they have certain CC intake port CCs, combustion chamber. May I suggest that for whatever, if you're at a loss, just buy the ones with the smallest combustion chamber. Why do I choose that? Because if your uh, combustion chamber is smaller, you have more compression on the street with a flat top or a flatter piston, not a dish. Because once you buy some of these cylinder head with, with 68, you know, 72 cc, 74 cc combustion chamber, to have a small block here, and then you end up with a dish piston, you're up, <laughs> you can build any day you want, you're not gonna make the power, it's gonna be a slug. Even though the guy promises you, oh, this, this is the best cylinder head, yeah, but if it's a dish, the combustion chamber is irrelevant. It's not going to act the way it was designed to be. Uh, this peanut uh, combustion chambers or even like the AFR has got an excellent combustion chamber. It's better if you buy the head, let's say 55 cc, I've seen that for the Fords, or 56, 58. Therefore, if you think you want to lower down the compression, you can just carve out the combustion chamber and make it bigger, right? And make it... 62 or 64 cc but once you have 72 cc and you want to knock it down guess what you get a millet which upsets your rocker uh, geometry your push rod length and not only that uh, trying to get down from 72 cc all right and then you have a dish piston it's a hell <laughs> it's a lot of work to get up to nine and a half or ten to one if that okay and uh, I would suggest welding it because now you now you know the seats, what's the condition of the seats? If you don't paint it, they might fall off. This thing's, all right? So buy the smallest combustion chamber and adapt your piston configuration, your head gasket thickness. It makes life easier. Because sometimes, I had one guy before, he came, come up to me and he says, hey man, I bought this head for a discount. Uh, what is I think it's a 76, by the time we measure, is that AFR? Or was it a, well, one of the aftermarket? 76 cc combustion chamber. That's huge for a small block. And then when it showed me his piston, it's dished. <laughs> Probably ended up with eight and a half to one. And he wants to make 500 horsepower. And then I, I asked him, he goes, yeah. Uh, it'd be pretty hard, buddy. It'd be pretty hard. So let's make it easier on you. Start with 11 to one, 11 to five. I had the previous video you know, about cylinder heads, <clears throat> cast iron versus aluminum. It's not a problem to run 11 to 1, 11 and a half to 1 with a light car. Plus, if it's a stroker, it doesn't work as hard. Plus, if it's geared, it doesn't work as hard. All right? It's when you have a heavy car with a power glide, heavy car with an automatic without a stall convert. You have a 327, 350, 351, okay? And you have a Chevelle or you have a Galaxy, <laughs> all right? And and you're trying to make this thing run on pop gas with such a small cubic inch, it's going to be tough going. I wouldn't suggest it. And also at the same time, an aluminum head dispels more of the heat. The combustion chamber runs a little cooler. You may lose a little bit of torque and response if everything's equal compared to a cast iron, but it is more resilient or resistant to detonating as opposed to a, you know, a cast iron. So I'd say 10 to 1 maybe ten and a half with a cast iron head. Everything being equal, the aluminum head should be superior in that regard. But sometimes it's not gone. Add some GT40 heads out there, which are going to get spanked by other uh, cylinder heads aftermarket aluminum offering. Tell you what, not the P head, but the GT40 three bar. Stoplight to stoplight. Most of these street cars are doing that. And you get out of the gate pretty doggone quick, all right? Even with a low runner manifold, you know, like a GT40 or the ones from Elbrock or, you know, YN, any of these companies with a long runner, uh, they have good torque. That, three, that 302 feels like it's a 351, okay? 
and that's not surprising. Spark plugs. Here's a deal. Now, I didn't get to the closest detail about spark plugs because I have a certain way of reading mine. And if somebody suggests to you, I want to see that thing light tan or light brown, whatever, I'm fine with that. I look at it differently. And um, whatever floats your boat, okay? I, I keep that to my group, what I look for spark plugs. But some basics will never change, right? For example, if you have an, any idea, if you get the right heat range, when you have the head off or before you put it on, screw the spark plug that you want to run. I prefer NGK because it's the most readable. All right? And I've seen guys check their engines at the racetrack or whatever, running a plug that is really quite impossible to read. They don't show their color accurately. And then all the readable, oh yeah, it looks, it looks lean. Let's put more jets. Huh. I have many stories about that. All right? Choose a spark plug that reads. NGK, okay, just the basic NGK plug tells you a lot. Here you go. What you want to see is on the spark plug threads, you want to see two combustion coloring on the threads. That means it's deep enough into the combustion chamber, not like if it's too, too uh, uh, far in, or it's not reading any combustion color in any of the threads. Like I said, one to two. Three might be a little bit too hot. So two, I stay with that. Now, if it's a projected tip spark plug, watch out for that, all right? Somebody put it, oh, you know, projected tip spark plug and then two threads, now you just smack the piston, especially if it's a flat top. So avoid that as well. But at the same time, when you're at the racetrack or even on the street and you're, you hear a little bit of detonation and you take the timing out, for a certain RPM, so it's going to detonate, but you notice you lose a little bit of power. One of the adjustments you can do is that you can put another washer on that spark plug, right? Let's say it's three threads showing. Put another washer, it might bring it in and end up showing only two or one and a half. That's a good way of adjusting your heat range, right? For the meantime, let's say you're on a racetrack and the, you know, the the altitude change, everything, environmental, uh, I mean, the, uh, the you know, uh, atmospheric pressure change and everything, and now you're detonating with your nitrous car or supercharger or turbo or even NA, high compression, very high, high compression. And let's say you just got it on number seven, spark plug, you're detonating. Just put a washer on there. Retract that spark plug deeper, okay, away from the combustion center combustion center, chamber center. You sink it deeper, it tends to run a little bit cooler. It's not exposed in the, in the uh, main source of heat, which is the center of the combustion chamber. Right? Once it goes, it lights up. Now, uh, I've always stated that uh, in ultra horsepower numbers or very, very uh, radical engine combination, things reverses itself. In the old days, we ran spark plug range. I mean, spark plug gaps of 45, or 35 is too small, they say. So we're on 45, 55, 65. I've seen some guys before, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago, uh, 80 thousandths gap. Oh, it got better. Well, maybe, maybe it did. But I tell you what, the problem with that is when you got high compression and you try to jump across a 65 thousandths. 75,000 spark plug got the atmosphere is thick from the high compression, even with nitrous, okay? You don't want to jump the, the gap. Guess what it'll jump? The wires, or sometimes the cap. And I said that story before, when I had uh, racing, racing against the Grand Nationals in my Mustang, I was the only NA uh, uh, participant then. And I really have to work hard to keep, keep up with this nitrous turbo and supercharger guys, being the only NA guy. And I'd get up on the trans brake and the doggone thing would, would misfire. Eventually, you know, my crew went up to the starting line with hood off, lights off, uh, Terminal Island. And then when I get on the trans brake, the spark plug gap, it looked like a Christmas tree. 
All right, I had all this spark going on. That's when I realized after struggling with this thing for many, many moons, <laughs> and um, I lowered down the spark plug cap. And at that time, people were saying, well, you got too much compression, Ben. This is, you know, 1990, 89, 90, 16, 3, 16, 5 compression. Oh, I had too much. You're never going to make that thing run. Uh, it wasn't the fuel. It wasn't my combination. It was the spark plug cap. So I ended up, you know, cutting down to like 26. Yeah, no more problem. No more hesitation. No more jumping of the spark plug uh, or the spark across the cap. None of that stuff, and I kept my mouth shut. And everybody goes, oh, I want to run a 16.5, it's too much. It, it could, wouldn't, wouldn't run at all. So today, you know, heavy nitrous, heavy boost, everything. It's not surprising to run a spark plug cap of 21, 23, okay? Uh, to tell you what, it's not gonna cost you anything because when the combustion chamber goes, especially with nitrous, it's gonna light up. You don't need a big fire to blow up this garage if you have good <laughs> uh, atmosphere for combustion here. Only there's a little spark and BAM! This whole garage will blow up, all right? Therefore, like on nitrous oxide, it's such a nice uh, burn enhancer. With a small spark plug like gap, 23, 21, it'll jump, it'll light up, okay? It doesn't take much, not like it was NA. Therefore, at the same time, uh, we don't index on a nitrous engine because whatever position is that, as long as it doesn't hit the uh, combust uh, the piston dome or, or the piston in general, uh, you're gonna be okay right? because anything, a little spark will let it go. It'll combust with nitrous oxide. Kind of hard with turbo and uh, supercharger. Okay. Uh, but uh, nitrous oxide, it likes that, it'll, it'll do it. At the same time as well, like I told you, you retract the spark plug by adding a washer on there, it attracts it deeper, not deeper in the combustion chamber, but shallower in the combustion chamber, away from the, the heat source. Uh, keep keep that spark plug a little cooler, prevent it from melting or overheating. At the same time, you look at the spark plug gap like this, right? What I usually do is I cut the ground strap shorter. When I cut the ground strap shorter, what's going to happen here is that the ground strap is not going to run as hot as before because the path between uh, the gap, okay, the center electrode and the ground strap, if it's shorter, it tends to run cooler. That's why sometimes, you know, when, when I'm looking at a spark plug, you see me get it, take it off and I look at the sun and I go like this. Or if there's a, a light post there, I go like this. What I'm looking at is the squareness, the ground, the center electrode and the ground strap. When I see that ground strap and the center electrode start to roll, I'm starting to run hot, starting to melt. The ground strap or the center electrode will start to roll, the edges. And when I see that, I go, oh, okay, all right, I know I'm already lean. But it's running hot, so I do the adjustment. Cut the ground strap, because that's where the source of the problem is. It starts to roll over there, sort of melt. I cut it shorter and do the, the spark plug gap this way, okay? Uh, at the same time, you combine that with an extra gasket on the spark plug, it'll withdraw it in. It might save your day, especially if you get one troublesome cylinder. Uh, let's say number seven or number one, whichever one's giving you a problem, you can do that. Because sometimes, uh, you know, you can retard the timing because you have one troublesome cylinder that's giving you a problem. But when you retard, if you don't have the capability just to retard just that one cylinder, then everybody else suffers. But if you can somehow retain whatever ignition time you ended up with, and, but then again, you, you're able to, to do those adjustments, you know, adding a gasket and then cutting the ground strap a little bit. Here's a ground strap that is shortened. And if you notice this uh, spark plug that I got off somebody's race car, it had more than three threads showing on its combustion uh, indicator. Three threads plus. It's basically overheating. All right, so we added a, um, 
I think two or three, <laughs> I don't remember, uh, shims. We took one from the old plug, put one in or two, I don't remember, but it's showing too much thread uh, exposure to the combustion chamber and shortened the ground strap. And we're ma we managed to salvage that weekend for that particular race car. Uh, it didn't overheat the plugs and uh, burn them up. Just to make it function away from overheating or melting, then you might just save your day and maintain your edge from everybody else, or at least uh, keep your distance from everybody else. But once you start pulling down and then the rest of them are not happy, yeah, that's, that's going to be trouble. You're not going to get the maximum. And a last note about spark plugs or igni an ignition timing. If you have everything right on the money, the coloration and everything else, one thing that is truly amazing today, back in the old days with the low swirl, low tumble cylinder head and big combustion chambers and inefficient ring packs, it's not surprising to see engines requiring 38, 40, 44 degrees of total timing. In order, in order for it to make power. When you decrease it, it's amazing, they really lose power. So they have to run a lot more total timing than what we run today with today's cylinder heads and piston configuration, all that compact cylinder head with a lot of swirl and tumble. Anyway, having said all that, it is amazing when you look at some big block Fords especially the one that John Cossey has made, requiring 27 degrees total timing. Such a big bore compared to small block. Small block that I do, 28, 29, 30, is a good uh, combustion chamber already that's telling you there's less negative torque. The later you spark the ignition or initiate combustion by spark ignition, the farther it is towards TTC they're less negative torque. Negative torque is when it's fighting to go up and you, you ignite it at 40 degrees. It has to climb up. Not a, you know, let's say you're at 40 degrees total and then now it's requiring 30. That's 10 degrees less going up that it has to fight while the flame expands before it goes around the TDC that comes down. So uh, not only did, did you gain power, not just by airflow, but by combustion dynamics or a more efficient combustion chamber that requires less negative torque or less total ignition timing, thereby with uh, corresponding reduction in negative torque. It's 10 degrees less it has to come up to get to the same point, and there you'll see more power. That's why when you look at the Yates, you know, when I first started dealing with them, in the late 80s, early 90s, I was just blown away. Why in the world, <clears throat> you know, I went very, very fast with basically a head, cylinder head that flowed 283, 285 uh, CFM at 28. That's unheard of back then. That's a street cylinder head, flow-wise. But, you know, the car went in low nines at uh, roughly 2,800 pounds, 2,850. And, uh, at that time, I wasn't really appreciating the benefits of a small combustion chamber. There's a lot more of the heat is consumed or produced in a smaller combustion space, thereby the force pushed down on the piston as opposed to spraying it on a bigger chamber, let's say a 72, 76 cc chamber, as opposed to that Yates at 40. The reaction to the top of the piston is almost immediate instead of spreading to a bigger combustion chamber. It requires more. That's why this is amazing when you look at uh, the 429, 460 cylinder head by John Carson. Uh, in fact, one of these confirming accounts was uh, uh, my console at QMP, and they told me before they ran a, a big block Ford, you know, uh, with a cost head, and it required 27 degrees. What's that? Four or 500 bore <laughs> or bigger? That's huge. You kind of figured the spark is on this one end of the combustion chamber all the way to the, to the top part cover the combustion, the board space, and for it to only require 27 degrees, that means that flame front is fast without going to a, an explosion. The flame front is just rapidly going across and covering the whole combustion space, and of course the piston, and requires uh, a lot less, uh, you know, timing and thereby make more power. So there we are about having 
this kind of uh, effective combustion chamber. Oh, but let me also, um, because of RPM, the importance of swirl and tumble takes less importance. Because the higher the RPM, it, it has its own rapid cycling motion that keeps everything dispersed. Okay, I'm not talking direct injection. I'm talking about you know carbureted or or fuel injection in the conventional way. Uh, having this rapid cycling, uh, it keeps everything in suspension. Act, it's really act an active scenario. Uh, that's when it finally goes into the combustion space or combustion chamber, it'll light up real quick because you shook it and everything's aerated. But at a lower RPM, it needs a lot of swirl and tumble motion uh, to aid in further mixing so that you have a very homogeneous uh, condition that uh, uh, contributes a lot to a very good burn uh, sequence. Besides as well, let me also not uh, bypass this. Uh, quench also uh, has a diminishing uh, point of uh, return layer at high RPM. All right? Quench, swirl, tumble is a mixing motion and then quench is a slapping motion that further disperse the fuel molecules but at high RPM these things take a little bit uh, of importance. Uh, they have a diminishing um, uh, contribution because like I said the rapid movement of everything uh, creates the, the, a very good mixing condition. So I came back from the Philippine Islands and I had to uh, meet some people in a dispute over an oil additive that uh, supposedly damaged an engine and I think uh, make a long story short, I think uh, adding the oil additive was ill-advised on an engine that already has a rod knock. If you have an engine that probably you hear a slight knock uh, at initial startup, all right, maybe the oil additive will help Okay, from the dry start situation. One thing that I believe maybe I'm mistaken, I would like your input, uh, the thinner oils we run today, all right, when you start a car, you shut it off, you wait, like they say, you know, a couple of minutes before you check the oil because everything will drip down and uh, uh, your oil level will show the proper, uh, you know, uh, if it's full on the oil pan or not. But if you check the oil right after shutdown, a lot of the oil is still suspended up there. And what actually happens is that your oil level will, will be inaccurate. And uh, also with today's oil, especially with uh, weekend warriors that we have, I don't suggest running, you know, those very light five weight, 10 weight for our street hot rods, because I, I feel that this synthetic oil, when they're very thin, they don't have much adhesion time on the surface, especially the vertical. You could have the horizontal surfaces, sure, the oil will stay there and perhaps still drip down because it's so slippery. But on the vertical surfaces, like the cam bearings and all that, the rod bearings, uh, even the rocker arms, you know, through the trunnion, uh, you can have a dry start condition there. And uh, what a lot of people would do is that they add an oil additive. Well, to tell the truth, sometimes the oil additive has a negative effect on the, it has a, an adverse effect in the oil performance or the preference of the oil as far as lubrication is concerned. Because now you're introducing something foreign into that original formulation as, as opposed to a synthetic. Sometimes a synthetic oil um, has a bad tendency to uh, make a dry start condition worse because you know uh, they tend to slip down on the surface. And with all the surfaces that are horizontal, gravity comes down, they stay there if they don't drip off and have a dry start. But when they're standing, the surfaces, okay, like on the cam tunnel, cam bearings here, uh, they do have a tendency to have a dry start, especially the very light oil, five weight, you know, 10 weight. I think I would stay away from super light oil on my weekend warrior because that, the condition of a dry start is a very big possibility and also uh, adding uh, 
you know, a mineral based um, oil additive might help the situation with a very thin synthetic oil. Uh, I think I saw a, 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 an advisor sheet from Ford in regards to their, uh, uh, you know, their camshaft uh, uh, sprockets going bad. Uh, they they uh, suggested a plant-based uh, uh, oil additive, but my issue with that is that um, sometimes when you add a plant-based, you know, uh, additive, whatever help it may may provide, also changes the uh, uh, original design uh, chemical composition that they put in that whatever oil you're running, because now you're introducing something foreign that the manufacturer of the oil, whatever, uh, you know, uh, Mobile One or, you know, uh, Red Line or Amazon, I think they might frown on the issue of adding some kind of oil additive, besides maybe oil additive that they recommend or they manufacture. So it, it basically matches up to their formulation. So now you're, you're adding a mineral-based oil into this chemical formulation diester base or was it uh, polyurethane? I think if I'm not mistaken, it's been so long. Uh, it does have an adverse effect. Maybe, you know, totally reduce the effectiveness of that synthetic oil because you're introducing something foreign to their formulation and I don't think they appreciate that. So therefore, if you have dry start issues for your weekend water that may sit for a week, two weeks, or maybe a month, I suggest run a heavier oil. So it tends to cling more, excuse me, on the surfaces. So uh, dry start is not really an issue. And at the same time, uh, you know, and I think a lot of manufacturers will probably agree with me that when you add some kind, whoever's oil added formulation you might end up using, okay, except I see a lot of the manufacturers are trying to say mineral based oil additive tend to cling on the surfaces okay and that would help but ultimately what would that do to your, the performance of your pure synthetic oil because now you introduce something that is foreign to the formulation uh, to be seen I guess every additive is different like every oil is different we just have to go out there and test under extreme situation and see what happens. Trying to show up, um, you know, uh, stock blocks by cement or cementing the bottom half. Well, I've done that many times on a 351 and, or even 302 and even Chevys. All right, it depends how much shoring up you need to do. If you're running some kind of E85, you can pretty much fill the water jackets pretty high and still not have any overheating condition because once you fill the bottom half of the uh, the block, it kind of like solidifies the whole bottom end, all right? Now you tie them all together by having this, this cement in there as opposed to a freestanding bore like some of these Toyotas 2TG where the bore is is long at the same time the the base the base of where the bore sits and rest is very thin I think I've measured in 40 thousandths or no more than 50 thousandths there's hardly anything there so when you you put cement on the bottom it kind of like really stiffen up bot that bottom end and like a 2TG and I'm building an 18 RG right now some special project a 2TG uh, is a short stroke engine and then they put 3T cranks you know and the biggest mistake that I see in the Orient or in Asia is that they still use a short um, connecting rod. When you stroke an engine, you use a short connecting rod or a factor connecting rod. That's a no-no because you get too much angularity there and the side loading and the internal friction at high RPM uh, is going to bust that uh, cylinder wall or crack that block. So when you shore it up, you stroke it, and then you run a longer rod, it's tend to, to to stand up straighter instead of like this with a short rod and a lot of side loading in the center wall is split right there. So when you do this, now, um, how much do you put in, well, of block cement? It depends what you're trying to do. 
It was an all out, not even a street car, but a totally track car. I, I go to about uh, an inch from the top of the deck on the Fords, okay? Or maybe a little bit more if you want. And just have a little bit of water to transfer through the head, especially if you're running alcohol. You know, 85, you can get away, inch, inch and a half, okay? Uh, and then towards the front is you, uh, you uh, machine that little thing so that you have still have access to the water pump that will flow to the head because once you get right above on the, um, what do you call that, uh, freeze plug height, uh, you're basically shutting off the water pump port on the front of the block. So I tend to machine that uh, to facilitate the oil to keep uh, uh, running around the block. And also I use uh, rubber um, grommet. I don't put the freeze plug, of course, the brass freeze plug. I leave that off, I put this rubber grommet like this and put it on the uh, where the uh, freeze plug goes, then I fill the block. And while it's filling up with cement, I keep tapping it with a heavy metal, like pop, 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 pop. And what you're doing there when you're, you're hitting the side of the block is you're trying to push all the, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, air bubbles outside of the uh, uh, jackets. All right, so you gotta whack it with a heavy metal. Pop, 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 my head, hit her up, okay? And make sure that the block is level. Put a level gauge in there. And some, some, <laughs> uh, what do you call that? Uh, edges stand, they're kind of upright, so when you put the weight, they come down like this, but sometimes the block is real light, still tilted up. So make sure that you put a level gauge there, okay? Front and to the side, that everything's zero, then you put it, start putting the block cement there and start tapping the sides of the block with a heavy mallet just to get the air, all the air bubbles from underneath, not strapping, let it go up, all right? So uh, that's good. Now, when did I say, let me also add, before a lot of people are confused, why did you cement the, the block? Of course, to shore up the bottom end of the casting. But remember, a lot of people will say, well, now the engine's gonna run hot. Well, not really. The heat is usually on top of the head, and then, you know, a couple inches, one inch, two inches down the bottom, or down the top of the bore, and going down. That's where the heat is generally uh, centralized. When you look at a motorcycle, sell their head on uh, air cold, Harley Davidson, or the old Honda, Suzuki, Yamaha, you know there's a lot of fins on the head. And when you look at the spark, like suck right in there, okay? And you see it's all covered up by the fins. And then it goes to the cylinder, and a lot of fins on the cylinder. Gradually, when it goes down to the base of the block, it gets smaller and smaller. More more of the fins is on top of the head, and the top part of the uh, cylinder board. But there's hardly any fins on the bottom of the cylinder wall because there's no heat being or emanating from that part of the engine. The main heat is on the head and the first inch to two inch depends on really on the stroke, how much stroke you have. But generally it's like that. Okay, so you can pretty much cement. Okay, I did that uh, 2JZ on E85, that's turbocharged, man, 1250 horsepower back wheel street car. Uh, I'll try to put uh, the video together on that. Uh, that's 1,200, you know, 50 horsepower. Uh, the block is cemented. Okay, I good them up, and uh, I got it there as well. And there's no overheating issues with that. And uh, same thing with the V8s and uh, the four-cylinder. I will also do uh, showcase that video, the two TG and an 18 RG. Uh, they really need a lot of help. All right. So uh, take note of the fins on a water cooled, I mean air cooled head and look at what it tells you, all right? A lot of heat on the top of the cylinder head, that's why there's a lot of fins. Then on the top part of the cylinder, also wide, not as much as on the head, and then gradually comes down to almost nothing. But that's basically what you're looking at. There's hardly any heat generated on the bottom of the, the cylinder just like on a V8, four cylinder, or six, or whatever you want, engine you might have. Uh, before I also forget, 
um, let me insert this about camshaft, right? And I stated I don't run flat tap it for the street. Uh, just a general knowledge. When you advance a camshaft, it increases your low end torque or response. When you retard the camshaft, it increases the top end pull, all right? At the expense of low end torque or response. Also, when you, when you advance a camshaft, the intake valve gets closer. And then when you retard the camshaft, the exhaust valve gets closer. So sometimes when I assemble an engine and I look around and, and I put clay in it and I cycle it and I, I look, okay, uh, you know, sometimes they say 100 on the intake to, uh, valve to the piston, 100, they'll say, oh, that's close. Well, I would run it much closer than that. But here's the issue. If there's a high RPM engine, that 100 will actually increase because of chain stretch. When the chain stretches, guess what? The camshaft retards. Therefore, your intake valve to piston clearance also increases. Okay? Now, on the exhaust, let's say camshaft is straight up, whatever spec uh, the cam car says, and you got a pretty close exhaust valve to piston clearance. Beware, because at high RPM, that will get close. The intake valve will get farther away, but the exhaust valve will get closer because the camshaft is retarded. So sometimes when you're looking at issues like, okay, uh, I have too much, uh, I have a very close exhaust valve to piston clearance, and you don't want to go cut, take it apart again, just advance it four degrees. You might see another 20, 25, 30, depends, but that's pretty much, uh, representative, advance at four degrees, and you'll see that come up. The clearance on the exhaust valve will get better because you forwarded the camshaft. And same thing with the intake. If you're too close, then retard it. The only thing with retarding camshaft, uh, I, I don't like it sometimes, okay? Uh, uh, if it's designed to be run in a certain uh, position, uh, the manufacturers know that. Uh, it's just a suggestion, and it's pretty much close to ideal, right? Or else they won't be successful building camshafts for a lot of people. And I take heed to what they recommend, and then I just make my adjustments from that point on. Carburation or fuel injection. Well, this is a... Okay, uh, I've seen dyno tests, like I said before, uh, going through. I'm just rehashing my previous video, you know, when I saw a, a 10 and a half to one 347 Ford and it made best power with a 950 CFM carburetor. Sure, I don't doubt that, but again, when you look at that whole combination and this 347 is put on a fair lane, you know, a fairly large fair lane, full body and everything, uh, it'll tell you a different story, all right? Because uh, when I have the one I tested for one magazine. Well, I'll say they're in a car cap. I don't even think they're in circulation. When I got four carburetors from Holly uh, before they went to the FI, their fuel injection combination, the amazing part was the one that didn't dine well was the quickest at the racetrack. All right? And uh, the one that was most power was perhaps the slowest. So that tells you right there. Therefore, um, and I know a lot of you run Chevys or Fords, especially a 302 or 327. Um, when you put the 950, that's big, okay? And you have some kind of weight on the car. It'll dyno well. You go out to the racer, you stab that gas, it'll probably fall flat on its face. So what's the recourse? Sometimes, and I also saw a dyno thing that where they said, well, the vacuum secondary, the air-fuel ratio wasn't quite perfect. That's why it was somewhat down on power. I don't doubt that, because maybe the vacuum secondary is starting to open, or almost open. That was skewed the, the air-fuel ratio inside the car, inside the manifold, and screw everything up, and probably have uh, a reduction in power because of unequal or not so ideal distribution of the fuel, all right? Uh, and air because the throttle plate is not quite, you know, 90 degree down 
from close. Now, when you run a vacuum secondary, just like on the test, it may have not dynoed very well, but I bet you if you got some weight or automatic trance, then vacuum secondary will be quick. All right, and <laughs> I've seen it many times where I tell the guy, even big block uh, Chevelle, a friend of mine before, he had an 850 double pumper, and I don't think he really has enough compression in it. And 850 pulled right top in. When he switched to a 780, he goes, oh, the hell got it, man, this sucker is alive. Now, if he had like an 11 and a half to one, 454, 30, 40, 50, 60 over, whatever, sure, the 850 would have worked. But he had like a, you know, nine and a half or 10 to one, it fell flat on the 850. So it, by the time we put the 780 vacuum secondary, it might have dynoed too well, okay? But it was a lot more easier to drive, a lot more torque coming out of the gate, all right? So it's just not horsepower, peak horsepower. It is what's workable for your present combination. Now, uh, on my old car that won the Muscle Car National, the first small block to win, uh, that heads up co uh, configuration back in the late 80s, when we really didn't have too much aftermarket aluminum. You, you race everybody with stock heads, Ford, Chevy, or whatever. Big block also, Bill Pontiac. Mine was the only small block to win that muscle car series. And I had a 780 vacuum secondary in there with a quick opening uh, yellow spring on the back and a 50cc pump on the front. It was a stock CC, 30, so I had a 50cc pump in the front. Okay, so it gave me a lot of uh, shot and also, also a long duration because on the accelerator pump, the bigger the jet, let's say you're running out 38, it'll have an initial blast of accelerator uh, fuel coming out of the squares, but the duration is short. It just expels it. Now, when you have a smaller orifice, let's say a 25 or a 28, it's a not as much accelerator pop fuel coming out, but it's got a longer run time or duration wise. And with my combination and a 50cc Rio pop configuration with a yellow quicker opening uh, secondary, but I had like a, I think, you know, I played around with a 28 at high altitude and a 32 at sea level on my uh, squirter jet size. That gave me a good amount, but a longer duration because it wasn't really a big opening or orifice. All right, so I was playing with that, and I found the combination of work that I launched pretty doggone strong. All right, and uh, it didn't bog down; it yank the wheels. Not bad for a third of the only an FMX transmission. That's like having two engines in your in your car. The transmission is not an aluminum C4. It's a cast iron FMX. That's what I had with a champ converter. So I need a lot of help. <laughs> All right. So uh, sometimes you got to work with what you have. 